In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about Postgres releases, performance secrets, don't do this, and filter versus case. I'm Creston Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 252. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is PostgreSQL 15.2, 14.7, 13.10, 12.14, and 11.19 is released. This is from PostgreSQL.org. And the reason it was released is that there is one security issue that involves a client memory disclosure when connecting with Kerberos to modified server. So it looks like it's basically a man in the middle attack involving Kerberos. So presumably you will be unaffected if this doesn't impact you. In addition, there are 60 or so bugs that were addressed in these releases as well, or at least per predominantly for version 15, but other versions may have received some of these fixes as well. But if you want to learn more, definitely check out this piece of content. Next piece of content, exposing Postgres performance secrets. This is from crunchydata.com. And they're basically talking about what steps you need to take to be prepared to analyze the performance of your database. And the number one thing listed is use PG stat statements to record queries. And this is also the number one tool I use if a client comes to me saying their database is slow and they're not really sure what queries are causing the slowness, go straight to PG stat statements and you can determine what those are and you can then look to individually optimize those queries. Number two is log slow queries, about a one second interval and that's definitely what I do as well for the databases that I set up. Next is log the explain plans for slow queries. Now I don't immediately jump into doing this because it does have an extra load on the database so I only do this if I'm seeing variation between running the queries individually versus what actually runs in production. But definitely a useful tool to get some of that insight. Four kill long running queries. And basically he's suggesting putting a statement timeout on the database. And I usually don't like doing this because I always end up forgetting that there's some statement timeout and I'm running a long statement DBA related using Postgres and it times out sometimes. So generally I just like to set the statement timeouts at the role level or at the user level so that, for example, the application user can't run something longer than 30 seconds. But if I need to run some sort of DBA-based task, it's not going to hit the statement timeout. Or maybe they have different statement timeouts. Maybe the Postgres user has an hour or two statement timeout or something similar. But definitely great things to do to address your performance. Next piece of content, Vostim 2023, don't do this. This is from vryrust.org. And he's talking about a presentation that was done at FOSDEM 2023 in Brussels titled Don't Do This. And this is from Jimmy Angelakos. And I really love his presentations and I definitely like this one as well. So if you want a great presentations of things you should try to avoid, I definitely encourage you to check out his YouTube video of this presentation here. Now we'll say there's two things I still do where he says not to do. One of them is using timestamps without time zones and using serial data types as opposed to the generated column capabilities of newer versions of Postgres. And the only reason I do that is because my application framework still uses those. But definitely a lot of great suggestions in this presentation. Next piece of content, the performance impact of SQL's filter clause. This is from blog.joq.org. And this is probably in reference to a blog post that happened last week that we had on Scaling Postgres where they were looking at comparing filter to case, but they didn't talk about performance, whereas he actually analyzed the performance, particularly in Postgres, and noticed about an 8% variance where filter was, as he says, 8% faster than the case statement. And he said he was able to add an auxiliary predicate to it to get the timings more similar, but you shouldn't really have to do that. So, so this may be the case where the Postgres planner needs some improvement, but definitely check out this blog post if you want to learn more. Next piece of content, adventures in embedding Postgres schemas in GPT. This is from canvasapp.com. And they have an application that allows end users to do data analysis without having to know SQL. And they said, gee, wouldn't it be great to use natural language that then the language model of GPT could then translate into SQL? So they go through the process of trying to get that working. 
and ultimately they decided it's not quite ready for prime time because sometimes it just gave vastly incorrect results and also giving them enough context the price they would have to pay for all the context that would need to be sent with a prompt was too extreme. But definitely interesting insight, and I foresee this becoming a reality in not too many years. So definitely encourage you to check out this piece of content. Next piece of content, SQL tricks for more effective CRUD. This is from crunchydata.com. And by CRUD, they're meaning doing a create, read, update, or delete, typically through in some sort of application framework. Now he says SQL tricks, but these aren't tricks to me, but maybe for most programmers there are because so many of the ORMs operate on a single record at a time, at least in terms of modifications. Clearly you can pull more records, but a lot of the modifications happen one at a time. But SQL can very easily insert multiple rows as a part of a single insert statement, which is great for performance reasons. You have less commits that are happening the more rows you can do at one time. You can return data from one query and use it in another, all as a part of one statement. He talks about reading and joining multiple tables. He talks about when you're doing an update, you can actually look across multiple tables and insert and change mul multiple rows at one time. And the same thing for deletes as well. So again, they're not really tricks, that's just how SQL works. But I think the application frameworks, when they are working with CRUD, they're only working with one object at a time or one record at a time, whereas SQL is designed to work with many. So if you're a programmer and you didn't know you can do these sorts of things, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, quick logical replication checklist. This is from cortex.wordpress.com. And this is exactly what it says. It's a checklist of things to check when you set up logical replication to make sure it's working and there are no errors. So I'll just leave it at that. Next piece of content, when to use vacuum full. This is from depeche.com. And basically he's saying never. <laughs> he says, if you think you need to use it, it probably means you need to optimize your auto vacuum to run more regularly or you can always manually kick off regular vacuums, but don't do vacuum full because it locks the whole table. So you can't write to it, you can't even read from it. So select stop working as well. So you definitely don't want that. And an alternative is to use PG repack to do it. So this is an extension that rewrites the table but keeps the existing one active. Of course, the disadvantage of this, even with vacuum full is it, you need enough disk space to do it. Now he does advocate in here that you can use PG repack to redo indexes as well, but I'd rather just rely on re-indexing concurrently that is built into the recent versions of Postgres now. But if you're using an older version, perhaps you would like to use that feature as well. Now, related to that, this is the episode that Lucas covered on five minutes of Postgres, and it's never run vacuum full, how to run PG repack on Amazon RDS and Aurora. This is from pganalyze.com, and he basically covers this post as well as gives some additional insights on working with RDS and Aurora. So check this post out if you're interested in that. Next piece of content, find text in any column of a PostgreSQL table. This is from endpointdev.com. And he's saying, I know there's some text that exists. In this case, he says, Kilroy somewhere. How do I find it? And he says the first solution was doing a PG dump of the whole database and then gripping through the dump file to try and find that record. Another alternative is using a copy or backslash copy to copy out that table to a file and then grepping through the file to find the record of interest. But he says you can also use row types. So you can use a query here using a row type of text to try and find this instance. And this enables you to search through a table to find text in any one of the text columns as it were. And then he has this additional command using gexec that basically formulates the same query for every table in the database. So you can search for text in every table of the database for this instance. So definitely a great reference to have if you ever need to do this and check out this blog post if you want to learn how. Next piece of content, how to get a row and all of its dependencies. This is from Depeche.com. And you have a row in a table and you may have foreign key relations to other tables, well, how do you get that row and then all the rows that are related to it? And he actually came up with a basic schema here, three tables and inserted some data and says, okay, let's try doing this. And basically he did a whole set of functions to be able to do this. And basically what he did is 
presented the results in JSON format. So as you can see here, you have the records and then the associated records nested in it. So if you're interested in doing that, definitely check out his blog post. Next piece of content, now you can backslash D table, not only in PSQL. This is from Depeche.com as well. And he created a function called PSQL hyphen backslash. That's a set of PLPGSQL functions that replicates the backslash D command in PSQL. So this is something you could run if you're using an SQL interface to Postgres, but it's not PSQL. Frankly, I'd probably just use PSQL to do this, but if for whatever reason you have a different tool, you could use this to get the same type of output as backslash D. Next piece of content, waiting for PostgreSQL 16, allow underscores at integer and numeric constants. This is from Depeche.com. And to me, this is awesome. Like if you have a really long number now, you can put underscores in that won't essentially impact the number, but it helps for readability and to make sure what you're typing in is exactly what you want. So definitely great to see this. Next piece of content, reserve connections in PostgreSQL 16. This is from cyberdeck-postgresql.com. And we discussed this enhancement uh, last week in Scaling Postgres, whereas you can reserve connections not just for regular super users, but also other types of users can still connect to the database if you need to. And the main thought of this is that as users are granted other rights that are administration-like, maybe doing backups or some sort of other operations like that, you could give them reserve connections as well. Next piece of content, relational or non-relational Postgres. This is from softwareandbooze.com. And this is his submission for PGSQL Friday. This one he talks about going from ETL, which is extract, transform, and load, to a lot of times people are doing transformations in Postgres. So it's more of a extract, load, transform. And this is talking about relational and non-relational data given PGSQL Friday's topic. And then related to that, we have the PGSQL Friday recap that covers all the different posts. And this was posted on blog.rustprooflabs.com. Next piece of content, Invoking your own Perl from PL Perl. This is from fluca1978.github.io. And this is basically how we can use Perl within Postgres to execute external Perl programs. So he covers how to do that in this blog post. So check it out if you want to learn more. Next piece of content, what's new in Citus 11.2 for Postgres plus Petroni HA support for Citus? This is from citusdata.com. And... As you can tell, 11.2 of Citus is released. They made a lot of improvements to distributed tables in that they can handle more SQL and DDL features than they could in previous versions. And they list the new capabilities down below. But also what's of interest is that now Petroni 3.0 supports working with Citus. So now you can have your scale out database that also handles high availability through Petroni. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, pre-compiled headers in PostgreSQL. This is from peter.eisentraut.org. And he's talking about with Postgres in version 16, they're moving to the Mason build system, which has support for pre-compiled headers and what are the ramifications of that. And basically not so much for anything non-Windows, but it definitely improves build times with Windows. So if you're interested in learning more, check out this blog post. Next piece of content, Postgres GitOps with Argo and Kubernetes. So if you're looking to run Postgres on Kubernetes and doing it with a GitOps workflow with Argo CD, definitely check out this blog post from crunchydata.com. Next piece of content, there was another episode of Postgres FM this week. This one was on benchmarking. So if you want to listen to their episode or watch the YouTube channel, definitely check out this piece of content. Next piece of content, the Postgres Girl Person of the Week is Betrand Drovu. If you're interested in learning more about Betrand's contributions to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. And last piece of content, we did have another episode of the Rubber Duck Dev Show this Thursday afternoon. This one was on hobby programming with Nick Schwarderer. So if you want to join us for a discussion about programming in your off time, definitely welcome you to check out our show. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.